Good morning. Good morning. The Bible tells us, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. May that be so this morning as we worship together here at Hively Avenue Mennonite Church. Welcome to each one of you. Uh, we're glad that you're all here. Whether you're present here or listening to us online, we're glad that you've joined us. Today we continue our series on finding hope in hard times. Our theme today is finding guidance in hard times. How do we respond to God's grace? You might note the focus question that's listed at the uh, top of your bulletin. Can you recall a time you reacted in love, even though it was hard, and you know it was the right decision? Think about that. Maybe you'll have something you will want to share during the sharing time. I invite you to join me in the call to worship. If you'll take your bulletins. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. God's greatness fills us with wonder and with awe. We worship a holy God who inhabits our world and lives within us. Join me in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, thank you for inviting us into your presence. Make us keenly aware of what you want us to know and to do, and help us to respond appropriately. We confess that we often neglect to do what we know we should and do those things that displease you. We ask your forgiveness. You who open doors and dismantle barriers, open our hearts to praise you, that we might live the full truth of who we are, that we might live as neighbors and friends, no longer strangers and enemies. Open our hearts to the transforming power of your love <clears throat> that we might forgive and reconcile, making peace and learning war no more, that we might be your people, one body and one spirit, to tell your grace to all the world. We pray in the name of the one who walked among us as brother and friend, even Jesus our Savior. Amen. I invite you to take your hymnals and uh, turn to number 28 as Ed comes to lead us. <clears throat>
113. This has been our song of the month, so by now we should know it fairly well. We will sing um, the first verse in uh, Lingala, and then we'll sing verses 1 and 2 in English. Okay, and remember we repeat each, uh, section. each section. We know God's reign will surely come. What a promise. It's time to light our peace candle. Our world is troubled with much violence and evil and divisiveness and deception and disasters. It can be overwhelming. How shall we respond? Where is hope? God does not expect us to solve every problem, but to be his presence in those situations that we encounter and where we can have influence, so that in our life, God may be glorified. Hymn 754 is a prayer that God be glorified through us. Following our peace litany, I invite you to sing this song as our prayer. But now in, join me as we recite the peace litany in the bulletin. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. Today we light this candle as a reminder of our honor.
It's now time for the children. Sue Ann has something prepared, so we invite the children to come forward. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good. I'm glad to hear that. So let me see if I can find my, oh, here we go. Here's my paper. Is it sometimes hard to do the right thing? Yeah, yeah it is sometimes hard. Sometimes we know what we should do. But sometimes it's just really hard. Maybe sometimes we have a friend or somebody who makes fun of us or something, and we know that we should do something, but it's really hard. And I'd like to share a story with you this morning about a girl named Zara. And this book is called, am I not on? Oh, OK. Um, I can help. So the leaves were just turning, just getting ready to turn, and school was starting. And there were 18 kids in Zara's class, and one of them was named Kyle. We're going to learn more about Kyle. Now, Kyle is really great at drawing. He always has his sketchbook open. And he's really good at drumming. He's always tap, 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 tap during the breaks. But Kyle is not so great at reading. He has trouble sounding out his words. Kyle isn't great at handwriting or cutting or gluing either. He needs someone to help him. So every day, Mrs. Underwood, do you know we have a Mrs. Underwood here in church? She's right there at the piano. That's Mrs. Underwood. You know her as Crystal, but her last name is Underwood. So every day, Mrs. Underwood says, who will help Kyle? Who will be Kyle's helper today? And I always raise my hand. I can help. I can help. This is Zariah here, raising her hand. I'll help Kyle. Because Kyle is generous, he always shares his favorite chocolate chip cookies at lunch. And because Kyle is funny, he is good at telling jokes. And because Kyle's kind, he always smiles at me. So they're having a good time at lunch here. One day, Mrs. Underwood chooses me to help. We do such a good job that Mrs. Underwood gives me not just one, but two thumbs up and tells me, Zariah, you are really a super helper, aren't you? And I sit up nice and straight because I feel really good. Kyle copies me. He sits up nice and straight, too, and we laugh. Later at recess, I take my turn. I take my turn, and when I'm all the way high, I realize that the leaves are no longer thinking about changing color. They're already changing color. The colors of red, pepper, and cumin, and turmeric the spices my Nana uses to cook. Even though I'm at the top, I can hear my classmates talking. Kyle, such a baby, says Tess. He looks really weird, says Ashley.
I want to keep swinging, but I stop. I want to stop listening, but my ears listen harder. Tess walks closer to the swing. She looks like she wants a turn. Why do you help him, says Tess. I want to explain why, but I don't. I'm going to give Tess a turn on the swings, but instead I just start swinging higher. Why do I help? I try to stop thinking about what Tess and Ashley said, but I can't. The next day, Mrs. Underwood asked me to help cut paper for Kyle. My hands feel heavy as I pick up the scissors. I'm ready to cut. I notice Tess and Ashley looking at me really hard. I put the paper down and my hands feel even heavier. Do it yourself. I say, pushing the paper at Kyle. I don't recognize my own voice. Kyle's face is stamped with worry. Zara, I noticed you're not helping Kyle today, said Mrs. Underwood. I want to answer her but I don't want my mean voice to come out. I keep blinking my eyes so that I don't cry. The next day, Ahmed helps Kyle. I notice that Tess and Ashley are smiling at me I look at Ahmed helping. I look at Kyle smiling and work, working, and I wish I could smile and work. But my lips aren't smiling today, even if I try. Does he know that I still want to help him? Look at her friends. Not very good friends, are they? <clears throat> I only look up when Kyle walks away. It's fall again, and I'm at a new school, and I have a chance to make a new start. Sometimes I find myself looking for Kyle, even though I know that he's not there now. It takes me a while to learn my way around, and I've never been in such a big school before. She looks a little afraid, doesn't she? One day, when the trees are golden like turmeric, I see a girl, and she looks just like Kyle. Today, she looks lost. Maybe she's new, too. I find my best voice, the voice that I know and that I'm proud of, the voice that's my voice. And I say, are you new? I ask her. I can help. So she had a chance to change, didn't she? Even though she felt like she'd made the wrong choice the first time, she decided that maybe that's not what she really wanted to do and that she really wanted to, to be helpful. So sometimes it's really hard and sometimes we make a mistake. And then we have to ask Jesus to forgive us and say, help us to do the right thing. 
That's correct, right. So Kyle wasn't at that school anymore. She went to a new school. But there was a new person that came. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes somebody gets a new job. Dad gets a new job. Mom gets a new job. And you have to move. So let's pray. Dear God, <clears throat> thank you for loving us. No matter what we do, we know that you always love us. We want to do the right thing because we know that you love us and that we want to love other people. So help us to listen for your voice and to go in the way that you would want us to go. Amen. You can take that back to the table and look at it a little more if you want to. You want to? No? You can take it and look at it. Our scripture today is from Psalms 112 and Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. I will read it in English, and Louise will read it in German today. So Louise, come forward. First of all, Matthew, uh, Psalms 112. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be, will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. 
It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. The wicked see it and are angry. They gnash their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked comes to nothing. And from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 20, the words of Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of God for the people of God. I will be reading the Matthew passage in German. Ihr seid das Salz der Erde. Wenn das Salz seinen Geschmack verliert, wie soll es seine Salzkraft wiedergewinnen? Man kann es nur auf die Straße schütten, wo es von den Menschen zertreten wird. Ihr seid das Licht der Welt. Eine Stadt, die auf dem Berge liegt, kann nicht verborgen bleiben. Man zündet auch kein Licht an, um es unter einen Eimer zu stellen. Man setzt es doch auf einen Leuchter, dann leuchtet es allen Bewohnern des Hauses. So lasst euer Licht leuchten vor den Menschen. Sie sollen eure gute Werke sehen und dann euren Vater im Himmel preisen. Meint doch nicht, dass es meine Aufgabe sei, das Gesetz und die Propheten aufzulösen. Ich bin nicht gekommen, um irgendetwas aufzulösen, sondern zur Erfüllung zu bringen. Wahrlich, ich sage euch, der Himmel und die Erde werden eher vergehen, als dass auch nur ein kleinster Buchstabe oder Strichlein vom Gesetz vergehen wird, bis es sich alles erfüllt. Wer also irgendeines dieser kleinsten Gebote aufhebt auf so die, und so die Menschen unterweist, der wird in der Königsherrschaft der Himmel zu den Geringsten zählen. Wer dagegen selbst die Gebote hält und auch lehrt, der wird in der Königsherrschaft des Himmels ein Großer heißen. Wenn eure Gerechtigkeit nicht ganz anderer Art ist als die der Schriftgelehrten und Pharisäer, so könnt auch ihr nicht zu der Königsherrschaft der Himmel kommen.
Pastor Pratik, come share with us about finding guidance in hard times. Uh, thank you, Leroy and all, for leading the uh, the worship today, this morning, it was wonderful. Thank you for the wonderful songs. And thank you for reading the scripture in Germany. Uh, I praise God for everything. Shall we look to God in prayer? Dear God, we come to your presence this morning. And as this time, we as a church, as your people, as your family, we are together here to learn from your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that you please speak to each one of us this morning. We pray that let you lead this time, O oh Lord, that every word that comes out of my mouth be anointed and blessed by you alone. Help us, O oh Lord, to learn your word and help us to follow it. In Jesus' mighty, precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Today's uh, sermon topic is finding guidance in hard times. And honestly, finding guidance in hard times is, is a very hard thing. And sometimes it is us who make it harder. An old sailor repeatedly got lost at sea. So his friends gave him a compass and they urged him to use it the next time he took, uh, so the next time he took the compass, and the friends wanted him to use it whenever he felt like he is lost so he can see the direction and he can get home. So the next time he's taking the compass with him, but as usual, he was unable to find the land. He was rescued by his friends once again. And they asked him, why didn't you use the compass? The sailor responded, I wanted to go north. But as hard as I tried to make the needle aim in that direction, it just kept on pointing southeast. <laughs> he was so certain that he knew which way was north that he tossed the compass aside as worthless and failed to benefit from the guidance it offered. And many a times the things that guide us, sometimes we don't take it or we take it for granted. We don't regard it. We just toss it, but there is value to it, and we don't recognize it oftentimes. So we sometimes make it harder to find guidance in hard times. Regardless of how well we put, uh, we put in our efforts or how long we try, if we are not doing things in the right way, it will never get us positive results. It will never get us positive results. One of today's scripture is uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 20. We all know Matthew chapter 5 to 7, that it contains one of the most famous and valuable sermons that was ever preached on this earth. It was preached by Jesus himself. It is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, most of the sermons that you will hear in your lifetime Somehow, all of them, in some way or the other, have a deep relationship with the essence of the Sermon on the Mount. Also, for us who are the Anabaptists, the Sermon on the Mount is critical as it offers a new or transformed way of living our lives in this world as the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today's passage which is Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 20, comes right after the passage on the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 1 to 2 is the setting of the Sermon on the Mount, and in verse 3 to 12, we hear Jesus saying or sharing the Beatitudes, which can also mean the supreme blessedness or happiness. In the final three verses, though, in verses 10 to 12, Jesus talks about the attitude of the world, that the, the world would see the followers of the Lord Jesus in a very different way, that they are going to mock them, that they are going to persecute them. 
And what is Jesus doing there? Jesus is guiding his followers to be prepared for the hard times. And that I found very blessed, that I found very interesting. Jesus is guiding his followers to prepare, to be prepared for the hard times they are going to face in the near future. Jesus is not guiding his disciples how to avoid those hard times. But Jesus is helping them to see why the hard times come and how to go through it. Which is very, very important, very essential for me. Jesus is teaching the disciples that they have to go through hard times, but what is their approach? How they understand the hard times really matters a lot. And finally, we reach to the chosen passage for today. That is Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 20. And I'm going to focus on mainly verse 13 and 14. It contains an incredibly important message for the disciples of Jesus throughout generations. In this passage, Jesus is telling his disciples to know that they are the salt and light of this world. Jesus does not say that you will become the salt and light of this world. Jesus does not say that you have that capacity if you work hard to be the light and salt of this world. Jesus says you are the salt and the light of this world. You and I are the salt and light of this world. When everything is going well with us, it is very easy to be grateful, it is easy to be salt, it is easy to be light. But when things go wrong, when we are going through a tough situation, when everything around us is not going well, when we are facing hard times in our lives, we need to focus on our true identity and rely on God's guidance to carry on. But regardless of what we are going through, whether it is a hard time or an easy time or a good time, if we are the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the, law, we are the salt and the light of this world. Now we all know and we all use the light and the salt in our daily lives. Both salt and light have many qualities that we are already aware of. But one of the greatest qualities of salt and light for me is preserving. Is preserving. In earlier centuries, when there was no freezers or coolers that we use so often, uh, frozen food, right? Many of us like it. It's quick and easy. But uh, those days, they did not have it. So they used to use the, the salt to preserve their food. And when we talk about light, the natural light or the sun, you know, I, I was reading an article and it said that the light that we enjoy every day is believed to be responsible for all life, for the production of air that we breathe, the cycles of the oceans, the magnetic field around our planet, the gravity, warmth of our weather. The sun is responsible for all of those things. So both salt and light have great quality to preserve. Salt adds uh, life to the food, and light is life-giving to all of us. But if we are the light and salt, what are we called to preserve or add life to? Verse 13 says, you are the salt of the earth, and verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. The Greek term that has been used here is cosmos which means the whole world. So the east, west, north, south, and everything in between is the world. Cosmos. So in other words, Jesus is calling us for a global mission to light up the entire world. It is true that every one of us cannot go to a foreign land and be a missionary. But there are plenty of mission fields around us in our own community. Also, that sometimes we also support many foreign missionaries and we pray for them, we help them financially and uh, uh, we, 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 we thus become part of their ministry. 
we also keep our eyes and ears open. We keep our ears open uh, to hear what God is calling us to do in other countries. There was a time when it was very hard for us to go out and be missionary outside our country and to preach the gospel. But now I, I believe in the context of U.S. it has become very easy because people from all around the world are coming to the U.S. And it is a great opportunity to be, to be a, a channel of blessing to them and to, to fulfill the mission of the Lord that is given to us in Matthew chapter 28 making disciples of all nations. So when we have disciples from all, we have people from all different nations, we can disciple them. And it is a great opportunity for us who are living here in the U.S. to disciple people, disciple people for Christ. When you say, or when, when the word says, you are the salt of this earth in verse 13a, Jesus was setting the listeners apart from the people who are not the salt of this earth. Who were they? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, who didn't want to be part of it. And when Jesus is addressing this to his people, he was telling to the people, the crowd who were listening to him, who wanted to follow him, and he was saying to them, you, you is plural here. You are the salt of this earth. Salt is perfect metaphor for the people of God. We have the res responsibility to transform the environment in which we find ourselves. The, the salt transforms every food we put it in. And so we are called to transform uh, our environment where we live in. We are often few in numbers, just as the few grains of salt. But we are called to bring light, we are called to bring taste in this tasteless world. Being salt is more than just being self-righteous, but become a person who can live a sacrificial life like Christ, who lived and died for the sake of the whole world. The word used here is plural, as I told you, so it can also describe the church as a community of believers whom Jesus calls to be the light of this earth. We as Christians, what are we called to preserve? What do we need to do as Christians? There are other social workers who are also working for the society, for the neighborhood. What is special do we bring to our, our neighborhood? Or to our families? Or to our church? We as Christians must preserve the reading of the Bible as the source of our meditation. There are many other books found for our meditations, for our spiritual growth. But Bible is the basis. We should preserve it. We should read it. We should also pre preserve the practice of prayer in our lives. We should also preserve uh, our families. We should make our families godly families. And I know that it is not an easy task. But we are the salt and the light of this world. And God is on our side, we can attempt to do our best. Jesus also warns that we should not lose our saltiness. And how can we lose our saltiness? One possible reason might be that salt might get absorbed in humidity and eventually evaporated and left behind a substance that looked like salt but did not taste like it. It can happen in our lives as well. When we are so much into this world, when we follow the values of this world and we forget what the scripture says, it might happen that we may lose the saltiness in our lives. The danger for the church today is that it is tempted to give too much of credibility to the values of this world, but very less credibility to the values that are found in the scripture. Further, in verse 14, Jesus told to his disciples that they are the light of this world. I personally believe that we cannot be light by ourselves without God. If God is not our source, we cannot be the light. We are the reflectors of God's light, and God is our source. 
God is the one who kindles light in us and he continues to transform us. And we become the reflectors of God's light to a world of darkness. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, his words are very powerful, who rightly said that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Only light can do that. The world cannot help itself. We are desperately needed. The little lights are needed to remove the darkness. Christ expects each one of us to be a light. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of this world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It is a promise that we will have the light of life within each one of us who are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes people associate darkness with hard times and light with good times. But the problem is, whether we are in hard times or good times, we are the light, and this light is meant to carry us through in both good times and hard times. What we sometimes lose or what we sometimes miss is the focus, is the focus. As a believer or as a person of faith, we must acknowledge our responsibility toward our, ourselves. What is my responsibility towards myself, my own family, my church, and my neighborhood? and make the best use of the light that we carry. We should learn to aim it at a particular target. I learned an uh, analogy of, uh, of uh, light that I found very interesting. When Thomas Edison, uh, Edison invented the light bulb, it was meant to give light. And we have uh, light bulbs all around us. And if you see the light, uh, you find that uh, it gives light in all directions. So it's not uh, focused on a particular direction, but it's just giving light to all directions. It's all over the place, in other words. But what about laser light? A laser beam is not just a focused light. If you just uh, you know, help this light to get some kind of focus, it will not become a laser light by itself. A laser beam is a coherent, coherent light. Furthermore, you cannot create a laser beam by cleverly focusing the regular light. If you focus this regular light, it will not become a laser beam. No matter how hard you and I try. You create a laser beam by using stimulated emission. Stimulated emission or radiation is what causes the light in a laser beam to be coherent and coherence is what makes a laser beam so much more useful than a regular light. In fact, the word laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. What does it mean? Why do we need to have focus? A single church cannot and is not responsible for doing all things for all people in the world. We need to select what we are supposed to do and what we are, what we can do. We cannot change all people around us, but we can certainly change one person if we are so focused on that particular person and trying to do our best to help that person. We should learn to aim our light to the selected targets that are within our reach and do our best to support them and influence them. While some of us are going through hard times because of our outward situations that we cannot control, some of us might be going through a hard time that is caused by overly stressing ourselves by trying to do it all. Let us seek God's guidance by relying on God and seeking focus in our lives. When we walk according to the guidance of God, we not only receive life, but our fellowship is life-giving to others. We add taste or beauty in the life of others who come in contact of our life. I'm not here to tell you what the word says because we already know what the word teaches us. But my, my point is, are we focused? Are we focused? Let us focus our light. So let us continue to make use of God's instructions and guidance that are found in God's word, once again, found in God's word that we know so well, 
that we have been reading from our childhood. Let us follow the guidance that we find here and light up the whole world that is around us. May the Lord bless all of us. Amen. As a song of response, let us all sing from Voices Together, number 762. Number 762 from Voices Together. Let us all stand. This is a time for all of us to respond in testimony and sharing, and I request you all to please share.